What's up, what's up, what's up? This is bathroom preaching, but I'm not in the bathroom today. I'm actually sitting in my study. Uh, today I want to talk a little bit about the cross. I'm going to be reading out of the book of Corinthians. It's going to be 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting at verse 18. It says, it says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made the foolish the wisdom of this world? Hmm. Hath not God made the foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them to believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men of the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound, to confound, to put to shame the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world mm, to confound the things which are mighty. So it says God chose the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God chose the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world, those would be the insignificant things. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, things which are not to bring to naught or to bring to nothing, things that are. So God chose the little insignificant things of the world, the things that are despised. God chose those. And then, and then it says, and things which are not to bring to naught, things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him... But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Chapter 2. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech, or with wisdom declaring unto you the testimony of God. Let me read that in the, let me read that in the way that Paul didn't come to you. Paul didn't come to you like this. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. Sorry if I offended some people there, but I think in just reading this, you might be offending God. Hopefully it's coming from your heart and not from your flesh when you do that. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God, the power of God, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, not being saved, it said if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart Jesus Christ is Lord, you shall be saved, not being saved, saved, so I'm going to tell you a little story about this cross and how the foolishness of this cross is so powerful. When I was a young kid, my early 20s, I had gotten a major record deal with a friend of mine. It's one at that time it was one of the biggest labels in the world. And I had, I had grown up believing in God, believing in Christ, and walking with Christ. And at this point in my life, when this major record deal happened, I departed from the truth and went way off as far left as I could. I lived a life of promiscuity. I lived a life of drug addictions, cocaine, marijuana, everything. I went as deep as I could go. And one night after 
after totally throwing away every opportunity that was there, uh, losing the record deal, losing a uh, five-year relationship with a girlfriend. I'm living in the country in a trailer with my mom and dad. Uh, no car, no job. Threw away every every uh, scholarship I had for football. Every opportunity that I had, I pretty much squandered and, and just wasted. Almost like the story of the prodigal son. I just blew it. And one night I was hanging out with some girls that were dancers for the group that I was in. And they were very attractive strippers. And we were all doing cocaine that night and drinking and smoking weed. And and they decided to play a game. They, they and, and it's kind of funny. You can have a bunch of people in this environment that decide to play this game. This game they wanted to play was... Let's see who can name the most books of the Bible. And immediately after they said those words, Bible, something in my heart became angry and hostile and very frustrated. See, because the preaching of the cross is foolishness to them that are perishing. The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. See, God had already sealed me with his life, sealed me with his approval, covered me with the blood of Christ. And even though I wandered from him, he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So his word was constantly penetrating into me, even though I put up a wall of hardness. So many ways, to make a long story short, I, begot, I became very irritated and very frustrated. And, and to, to digress from the story a little bit and speed it up, I asked to be taken home because I didn't have a car. So a girl drives me home, back to the country, back out in the middle of nowhere to this trailer. And I go into the, to the trailer, and I'm going to my little bathroom that was right by my bedroom. And I sit down on the toilet, and I'm going boo-boo. I'm, I'm dropping the kids off at the pool. I'm taking the Browns to the Super Bowl. And I'm blowed out of my mind. And as I'm sitting on this toilet, all of a sudden, I hear the voice of the Father. I didn't hear Jesus. I didn't hear the Holy Spirit. I heard the voice of the Father. And all he said to me was, you don't have to live like this anymore. God does speak. Not back then. He still speaks today. And when he said, you don't have to live like this more, I felt like a floodgate burst open in my heart. And I fell down to my knees, probably still had boo-boo in my crack. And I fell face first on the ground. started sobbing deeply. I don't think I'd ever cried like this in my life. And all of a sudden, I felt the presence of Jesus Christ. I felt the presence of him come into that little trailer park bathroom. And he said, I need you to stand up and look at yourself in the mirror. So I stood up and I'm looking at myself in this mirror. And I've looked in the mirror a million times since I've walked away from Christ. But I'd never seen myself the way that Jesus allowed me to see myself at this moment. And as I'm looking at myself, this dude who was in phenomenal shape, supposed to be a college football player and all this stuff, had a record deal and everything, has weathered down from about 185 pounds to about 155 pounds, looking like Mr. Salty the Pretzel Man that just smoked the biggest crack rock in the world. My eyes were just blowed black dilated. My pupils were just, just dominating my eyes. There was no blue in my eyes whatsoever. They were bloodshot red in all the whites. And my face was sagging and, and I looked horrible. And the Lord said to me, Jesus said to me, what do you see? Look at your eyes and tell me what you see. And as I look at myself, I say, I see a failure. And I just start bawling. The tears are falling into this little trailer park bathroom. You can hear them. Doop, doop, doop. So he says, I need you to look at them again. But this time, I don't need you to look at them, but look into them. And tell me what you see. And I'm thinking in my mind, you see, because Jesus knows our thoughts. He knows what we ask before we even ask it. He knows what we think. So as immediately when he says, I need you to look at them, I need you to look into them and not at them. I think in my mind, what is the difference if I look at them right into them? I'm still going to see these same black dilated pupils. I'm still going to see this just withered away looking piece of garbage that stands in front of me right now, myself. And he says, son, if you look at something, you see the appearance of what it appears to be. But if you can look into it, you see the potential of what it truly is and can be. So I'm like, I have nothing to lose. I'm either I'm really, really high right now or you're really, really here with me. So I put my face up to the glass as close as I could. I could literally see my breath on the mirror. And as I did, I began to see a vision unfold. It opened up like this beautiful picture, like Warner Brothers could never create something this amazing. And as I see this, I see this beautiful plush land, and it's just filled with green hills. And there was a river that flowed through it. And there were animals of all types of shapes that I've never seen before in my life. They were just the most amazing animals. Now, the beautiful thing about vision, the beautiful thing about being in God's presence, the beautiful thing about eternity is that there is, no, there is no such thing as perception. Everything is clear. 
Your eyes see everything just like it was in front of your face, no matter the distance. It's the most beautiful, beautiful revelation of vision. And all of a sudden, I see off to my right, and I can feel Jesus standing right next to me. I never physically got to, I never got to look at him, but I felt him right here beside me, just shoulder to shoulder with me, standing bigger than me. And, he, and he, I'm looking with him off to my right, and I see this man, and he's standing with these animals, and he's the most beautiful man I'd ever seen in my life. His skin was flawless. He had this beautiful hair. He had these blue eyes that were the most amazing blue I'd ever seen. And as I'm staring at him, I'm like, I'm captivated by him. So I'm staring at this man, and, and, I'm, and I'm like, Lord, is that you? Is, is that you, Jesus? And he says, no, my son, that's you. That's the way my father sees you. And immediately I refuse. I just deny it. And I put my face down and the vision just is just gone. And I'm back in this bathroom again. I literally was in this place. Now I'm back in this bathroom again. And Jesus is still with me. I still feel his presence behind me. And I'm sobbing into the sink. And I'm saying, Lord, that cannot be me. That can't be me. That's not who I am. That's not who I am. Jesus said to me, you don't fail. You only fell. Now get up. Keep running. That day changed my life because the foolishness of the cross, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But to us that are saved, it is the power of God. He gave his life so that you could live. And he said, no matter where you go, if you make your bed in hell, I'll be with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. My word shall not return void, but it shall accomplish that which it was sent forth to do, and it shall prosper in the thing therein. I will quote that scripture till I breathe my last breath, because God's word is true. Jesus gave his life so that you could live, and if you accept him as your Lord and your Savior, no matter where you go, he will never leave you. He will always run to you. He will always have your back. And he will always welcome you with open arms. The foolishness of the cross is the power of God to save you. God bless you.